Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gotham Writers Inside Writing. Today, we'll be talking about the dual genres of mystery and thriller. But first, a few announcements. Quick reminder that if you have missed any episode of Inside Writing or if you just want to revisit them, they can be found on the Gotham Writers YouTube channel as well as in podcast format on all your favorite podcast platforms. Also, in case you haven't heard the good news, the Gotham Writers Conference is a go on Zoom for October 16th through 18th. More on that at the end of the show as well. Also, don't forget that at any time during the show, even right now, you can submit your questions for the Q&A segment towards the end. Uh, there's a Q&A button on your dashboard of the Zoom window where you can put your questions and I'll pick some uh, the second half of the show and pose them to our panelists. Lastly, stay tuned at the end of the show for instructions on how to participate in the mystery and thriller Twitter pitch party. Now then, on to the subject of the day, mysteries, thrillers. Uh, we're gonna start with a quote from Ross McDonald who said, the detective isn't your main character and neither is your villain. The main character is the corpse. The detective's job is to seek justice for the corpse. It's the corpse's story, first and foremost. We'll talk more about that later. First, though, let's meet our panelists. Uh, author panelist today is the author of The Winter Sister and Behind the Red Door, Megan Collins. Hello, Megan. Uh, hi, Adam. Hi there. <laughs> That's all good. Uh, and our agent guest for today, Megan's own agent from Distal, Godrich, and Barrett, Sharon Pelletier. Sharon, hello. Hello. Hi there. All right, so we're going to start the way we always do with good old definitions. So, Megan, how would you define mystery in the simplest terms? Oh gosh, um, I feel like that is still something that I always am thinking about. Um, but I think that it's a story where um, you know whether it's a really like um, pulse pounding type mystery or one of the more like cozy mysteries. I think it's just a story where something happened and we want to know either who did it or why they did it. Is there anything to add to that? Um, not really. <laughs> I think um, if you're talking about mystery versus suspense versus thriller, um, those can be very, those categories can bleed into each other a lot, no pun intended. Um, but I think my association with mystery is there's more of a traditional detective or a police officer pursuing the case, and it's kind of more of a straightforward whodunit, let's find clues, let's find motives. Thriller can be maybe someone's dead, but there might not be true law enforcement leading the story. Um, and suspense, it might be more domestic or psychological and no one dies at all. Um, so that's kind of a very loose way of separating stories into one or the other. Um, but they, like I said, they bleed into each other a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, that answered my next question as well, which was how does it differentiate from thriller and suspense? So since you were kind of already going this way, I wanted to ask you, what, what are some of the key subgenres within mystery and thriller? I know there's cozy mystery, stuff like that. What else is there under this umbrella? Oh, good question. Um, well, you know, there's, in thriller, I think there's, there's military, political, espionage, um, paranormal mystery is kind of alongside cozies. Um, domestic suspense tends to be very relationship based or you know family based um what am i forgetting megan uh i don't know i think those are those are them <laughs> there are some every once in a while there's a historical mystery or historical thriller that pops up mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm curious megan when you started writing both your books did you have an idea of where it fit or did you just see it as a general mystery um, yeah, I had no idea. I tell this story a lot, actually, that um, when I first saw the deal announcement for The Winter Sister, and I saw it marked as a thriller, I was like, oh, they made a mistake. They called it a thriller. Like, I didn't know, <laughs> because I hadn't necessarily set out being like, I'm going to write psychological suspense, or I'm going to write a thriller. I had a story that I wanted to tell. I had something I wanted to explore. And this was just the way it came out. And then, of course, once I like took a second and thought about it, I'm like, okay, yes, if it, it fits. Um, and then when I was writing Behind the Red Door, I knew that as my follow-up to The Winter Sister, it would be marketed in the same way. So I just kind of like leaned into the genre even more, um, which allowed me to kind of get even darker and creepier, um, which are all things that I love. So 
so that was definitely on my mind for that. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that interesting. Sharon, how, how important is it for a writer to nail down what genre their story fits into, or is that sort of the agent's job? Um, the agent will definitely help, and there are times that I've taken on a project and the author has talked to me about it as one thing, and I think that it fits better, we'll, we'll have a better shot if we lean into a different category. Um, so it's not that it can't change when you're working with an agent. I think it's more if you are writing it in a way that you don't really know what it is, or you don't have a clear idea of which categories it might fit into, you're gonna run into problems when you're figuring out how do I wanna sharpen these stakes? Which direction should this character go? Which agents do I target? What comp titles do I choose? Um, because at the end of the day, I do have to decide what editors to send it to, and the sales team has to decide how to position it, and the bookstore has to decide where to put it, and Amazon has to decide where to code it. And um, if you're coming up and saying, well, this is a historical thriller that also has ghosts and a romance, and also it's for teenagers, but adults like it too, that's a lot for us to sift through and kind of see like, well, is this story coherent? And you don't know how to talk about it or have you not figured out what you want it to be yet? And so that's coming through in the writing. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to jump in and start talking about plot since plot plays such a big role in all stories, but in mystery and thriller in particular. Um, since it's often woven around a crime, usually a murder, that's, that's where the plot comes from. So I want to find out, Sharon, aside from plot, what would you say are some of the other most important story elements to mystery and thriller? Um, well, for me, character development is very important, both in books I'm looking at to work on, evaluating a client that I already work with their new project, and just as a reader. Um, I tend to respond really well to books that there's a journey for the main characters, as well as just finding out what happens. Um, they learn to think about themselves, they learn to think about their community, their family, they make a change. Um, and that's true of all fiction, and I think it still belongs in mystery and thrillers, even though you want to find out who did it and why. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, I mean, this is part of plot, but the why needs to be satisfying, which I think is something that people overlook, especially in, in this, you know, in the suspense market right now, it's very driven by big twist endings, but those feel unsatisfying if the twist is appears at the end and, and doesn't really seem to be connected to what came before and you don't believe why the character decided to act this way or why the the big reveal turns out to be what it is um so if you're just chasing a plot that will feel exciting and surprising and you haven't really worked out the why um that's something that i think is really important for both the character and the plot that's kind of what ties them together i suppose is what i'm saying mm -hmm. and, and megan from a writing standpoint would you say that you're primarily focused on plot or how, how do you, what, what are your primary focuses when you're writing a story? Um, I think for me, the plot kind of comes out of um, the characters in a way. Like I will start with a completely plot based thing to develop the story. Like I usually start, I get the germ of an idea from uh, like sort of a what if question. Um, and like my what if question for behind the red door was what if someone who had been famously kidnapped as a child went missing again as an adult and what what would happen so i get that idea and then from there the characters start to fall into place and then i know or have a sense of like what i want well, the kind of themes I want the story to deal with and the sort of emotional journey that the character needs to go on. And from there, the plot comes in as a way to push that character towards that, on that journey and, and finding the things that are going to come out and getting to the twists and all of that. Mm -hmm. So Sharon, is there like a, a basic checklist of something that all mysteries have to have? Because I feel like mystery more so there there are some certain things you just have to have in there that you don't necessarily have to do in other genres so is there something that every or a couple things that every mystery or thriller has to have um i don't know i mean i think that would definitely be true if you're looking within a genre you know so for example a cozy needs to have that recurrent theme of the bakery or the knitting shop or the small town that everyone loves um if it's an espionage thriller there needs to be you know, an agency that these main characters work for and a reason they're going to the part of the, the world they're going to. 
Um, but beyond that, I think, at least that's not the way I, I look at it, I guess, is the best way to answer that question. Um, I'm looking for, at the end, do I know what happened and why in a way that makes me feel glad I read the book and spent those three hours or whatever it is mm -hmm. with those pages and with those characters. Um, I'm not really looking for, well, this has to have this many red herrings or we need definitely two detectives and one is gruff and one is jokey or anything like that. Um, I think it, what every book needs to have is going to be different for that setting, that subgenre and um, the character's journey. Mm -hmm. And Megan, I want to turn that around to the writing perspective. I always find it interesting when people write a story and it ends up not being in the genre they expected it to be in. So when you were writing it, were you adhering to sort of guidelines within your genre or were you just kind of telling the story you wanted to tell? Um, I think definitely with The Winter Sister, I was adhering to those things kind of accidentally. Like I wanted to tell this story about... Um, a girl who had been murdered and it went unsolved for a really long time until her sister kind of gets pulled back into her hometown and and so because of the murder element and then the whodunit element that that lent itself to all those other um thriller elements um and then i think definitely when i was um writing behind the red door like i said i i leaned into those things more carefully more deliberately though it was never like pulling me in a direction where I wasn't telling the story I wanted to tell. I was still getting to tell um, the story that I wanted. I was still getting to explore the big themes that I wanted to. And um, actually, I think that uh, thrillers, psychological suspense are such a great avenue for exploring such like strong, big human um, conflicts, emotions, all of that, um, because you are basically, I mean, this happens in any work of fiction, I think, even if it's like a comedy, but you're sort of uprooting someone's life completely and derailing everything that they thought to be true or um, taking away something or someone that they thought they'd never lose. And so that sets them, you know, the stakes are really high and then um, there's just so much to explore there. So I, I love getting to explore those things through the thriller genre and have it be dark and all of that great stuff. Mm -hmm. And Megan, I'm curious, when you get to the especially in a mystery when you get to the middle and you do you do you still have those moments in the middle where you kind of get stuck and how do you handle them because i know with mystery being so intricately plotted is there a certain approach that you always take to overcome those blocks well i always have to work from an outline like a very detailed outline first so when i'm having those blocks they happen in the plotting phase not necessarily the writing phase um so and 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 that's really helpful to me because there's not pressure when I'm doing the plotting outlining to make it sound good. So I can just be like throwing out ideas and I don't have to also worry about like actually writing it. So um, I feel like there's more room in that time to explore different ideas. Um, so, and I definitely, I think every writer, whether you plot things out ahead of time or you just kind of see what develops as you write, I think that middle is, is really hard or for me it's actually always the middle I always know like the midpoint I want to reach um, there'll usually be some kind of big reveal or something that changes everything that the characters thought they were building towards um, but the middle of the beginning and middle and then the middle of the the middle and end or where it gets harder for me where you have to be building towards those things and making the reader think they're heading somewhere when they're really heading somewhere else um, and same with the second half of the book. So um, that's where it gets trickiest for me. Mm -hmm. and, and that segues into, I wanted to talk about this whole debate of planning versus pantsing, those who outline versus those who don't. Sharon, is there a such thing as a mystery or thriller writer that doesn't outline? I feel like it's something that you just kind of have to know where it's going before you start the story. Um, I think most of the clients I've worked with have been maybe hybrid, where they do a little bit of plotting and the story takes them other places once they sit down and write it or they're very elaborate plotters and are good at sticking to that once then they go in and bring out more character development and scene setting and all that um i don't think i've worked yet on a suspense book that was just no at least sort of a 
general roadmap of where the story was going to go. Um, that said, I do think that there's space in the category for someone who finds that pantsing is how they can find their characters and kind of the stakes come out that way. Um, sometimes you just have to, similar to what Megan was saying, let it spill out on the page messy and then look and see, well, what shape is this story? Where are my holes? And kind of counterimpose the plan on a really bad first draft. Um, and I think that might be an effective way to start learning how to plan a little more for someone who struggles with strict outlines but wants to write the kind of plot that requires a little more planning and tying together of, of pieces along the way. Mm -hmm. Megan, you said you're a pretty extensive outliner. So do you have it outlined from start to finish all the way and you know where all the hooks are going to be and then you just have to go in and sort of fill in the meat? Um, for the Winter Sister, I didn't have it that um, plotted out. Um, I more so had written down the big points I knew I need to hit. And then between those, I made little chapter by chapter outlines right, kind of right before I wrote the chapter. And then for Behind the Red Door, I plotted the entire thing out before I started writing. And then even then, I still would do a chapter outline before each chapter, just so I knew what it would look like to be condensed to, like, this is this part of the book, this is this part of the book, so it doesn't all bleed into each other. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, for the most part, I do really, I do a lot of pre-outlining plotting work. Mm -hmm. And I'm also curious, because you mentioned earlier, you're really drawn to the dark, dark motives that you can find here. Um, I'm curious, what kind of research goes into writing a mystery? Because they do deal with murder and, and intrigue and all this stuff. So what qualifies as good research? Can you just go read other mysteries on the bookshelf and count that as research? Or what, what sort of research did you do for yours? I think, I mean, I think, yes, uh, definitely reading other mysteries and thrillers. Um, but for me, my interest, I have an interest in true crime. So um, like my favorite murder is my favorite podcast and they talk about different murders each week. So um, I get a lot of information that way without even realizing that I'm kind of doing research, that I'm just listening to it because I'm interested in it or watching a documentary or something. Um, and I think that those are good forms of research, so to speak, because um, you're seeing how it's playing out in real life and how these were real cases and then you can pull things from that when you kind of make these fictionalized murders or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And Sharon, can you, is there dead giveaways where you can tell where something isn't well researched and is that a deal breaker for you? Um, it's, if it's a detail here or there, it's definitely not a deal breaker. Um, something that I am sure Megan is going to roll her eyes when I say this because I talk about it so much in edit memos is credibility traps or credibility holes where you're losing um, the reader's faith in you in a small detail that doesn't feel true unnecessarily because all suspense depends on the reader being willing to make a few jumps with you to things that kind of wouldn't happen that way in real life because it is a book and um, it wouldn't be interesting if it was just a, you know, minute by minute account of how real cases happen, because most of them aren't very interesting. Um, but you need to iron out the small points so that the reader isn't constantly noticing, well, who doesn't charge their phone for three days? Or, you know, would it really be the case that she locked her keys in the car three times in one month or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so if it's little things like that, it's not going to be a deal breaker. If there's huge problems in, um, the way the plot ties together or the whole reveal hinges on one huge leap of faith that the leader ha the reader has to take or something like that it's going to be a concern and also if if you're trying to write a ver um a story that requires a lot of expertise like for example a military thriller or a medical thriller or something that you would need to know a ton of detail about a very insular community and you don't have any ties to that and, and it doesn't sound like you know what you're talking about pervasive throughout the book that's the kind of thing that would be like well this might not be for me <laughs> mm -hmm. so i want to change gear a little bit and talk about the hook the opening scene obviously it's such a big part of everything but i feel like in mystery thriller even more so because that's sort of you know it, it's the introduction to the crime uh megan how, how did you approach writing the opening scene did you put a greater emphasis on it um yeah i mean I 
as it, in terms of my own like reading life, the way I evaluate whether I'm going to even read a book is if if I you know, look at the preview online, like in Amazon or something, and I read the first couple sentences and I'm not interested. Like if, if it, even if the premise seems like the coolest thing ever, but if the first couple sentences don't draw me in, I'm like, oh, I'm going to skip this one. So I really work uh, really hard on trying to make those openings really, really as compelling as possible. Um, and like for my debut, The Winter Sister, um, you know in the first sentence that somebody has died, somebody's been murdered, and that um, by the end of the first paragraph, you know that that murder completely changed the relationship that the narrator had with her mother. So you, you're getting this information already. Um, my second book, the one that comes out in August, um, the first line is, um, now that it's summer, it's not my job to protect the children, which to me, I wanted kind of an eerie opening, like, what do you mean you're not going to protect children? Or what do the children need protection from? Because there's a lot of that thematically in the book. Um, and so Amos Oz has this thing that he said that um, the beginning of a book is the contract between the reader and the writer. And I always think about that, that um, whatever you're giving them at the very beginning, whether it's the sentence, first sentence or the first scene or the first image, you are showing them basically like the thesis of the book, like where you're taking them thematically, atmospherically and all of that. So I think it's extremely important. And I think most writers probably pay a lot of attention to that. Mm -hmm. and, and Sharon, riffing off of that, do you normally, are you able to tell within the first few sentences or paragraph if you want to represent a book or do you, does it take more time than that? Um, not quite if I want to represent it, but I know pretty quickly if this is a voice I want to spend more time with. I'm really excited about where this story is going and that contract that Megan was mentioning is one that I I want to keep tying myself up in. Um, Megan is the queen of opening sentences. They're always amazing. Anytime, any manuscript of hers I've read or even just synopsis, someone's like, oh, yep, signing this contract. Um, but more generally, I think you, as an agent, you tend to know pretty quickly is there a voice here? Is there a presence here? And does this person understand where to start their story? Um, which is not to say that can't be worked on and finessed, but in suspense submissions, I often see, you know, an intense uh, prologue that's violent and scary and a lot's going on. And then chapter one, someone's waking up in the morning or someone's getting in their car to go to work, which in the first, it's high stakes, it's high adrenaline, but we don't know who those people are. We have no reason to care about them. And then in the second, you're really not interested in, you know, well, you're waking up in the morning, but how long is it going to be before we start finding out that opening scene? Um, and so, you know, you want to strike that balance between starting so in the middle of something that you have no idea what's going on and starting so far back that yawn next book. Um, so, I think that's what that is going to look like is different for everyone, but I think all of us who are really intense readers kind of know right away, oh, I'm going to love this book. And it's the same to some extent as an agent. Um, I, well, I guess I'll say you get to the no's pretty quickly. Hmm. And then there's a lot of, well, maybes or, or I hope so's that you read a little longer and see, mm -hmm. is this something that I got to have? Gotcha. So I want to revisit the quote that from Ross McDonald at the top of the show where he makes the claim that the corpse is the main character. Uh, obviously, these, it goes beyond just the corpse, but I think the point is that the crime itself becomes a character. Is that, is that, do you think that's the case, Sharon? Does the crime have to sort of take on its own entity in the book? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't heard that quote before you read it. I think um, that's going to vary a little bit based on the type of suspense. So if it's, a, if it's more of a detective oriented who done it then yes absolutely um, if it's more of a psychological thriller then it might be a looser definition of crime it, you might want to expand that to include secret um, or betrayal or something the thing that you want to find out who what and why might not be a murder or robbery um, it might be an affair or you know a secret love child or something like that um, but 
I don't think it's possible to write an interesting suspense where you don't really care about the thing at the center of it that you're waiting to find out the who, what, and why. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a high stakes external thing or a um, smaller, like emotional stakes internal thing that's driving it. Mm-hmm. And, and Megan, you've mentioned a lot with how these books got started, you, both of yours. Um, did you build them around a crime or, or did they start with a character? I mean, you mentioned that they started with sort of this question, yeah. but did that pair with the crime? Yeah, um, definitely. So both of them, the kind of question that I had that kept me going and thinking about this story relentlessly um, was, I think, if not the crime itself, then very closely related to it. Um, And I think uh, it's interesting, the idea that you were talking about with that quote of like the corpse becoming a character or whatever it is, um, because especially when there's murder involved in a mystery or a thriller, um, I'm always very interested, not even just in fiction, but like how we sort of mythologize the dead. Um, and we, we make them these bigger than life characters. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, you don't say bad things about someone who has died or whatever it is, or, um, so all that intrigue, from the murder itself then applies to the person who's been murdered and they become this this character that um even if they're not that consequential to what's going to happen to the character who the story is actually happening to um that that dead body sort of becomes a character itself and um so i think i think that's interesting i like that quote a lot of the mysteries i grew up reading um, you know, Agatha Christie's, things like that. And, and even more recently, I've been rereading a lot of uh, Tana French and Anne Cleves and just really, you know, comforting, deeply character-driven mysteries. Um, and the detectives will often say in all of these, you know, the key is finding out who the victim was. We need to go way back in their life and talk to their, you know, three jobs ago boss and person who's at the next cubicle. And I, I was thinking today, I was like, how often do real police officers or real detectives actually put that much time into it. Um, But I think in when you're solving a murder in the world of fiction, that gives you so much more scope to pursue character development and pursue, like Megan was saying, the big questions of human nature that are what the mystery is really about. Um, So maybe in real life crime, the the corpse is not a main character as often as it is in fiction crime, um, but it makes for really good fiction. So I have just one more question about dead bodies and then we'll leave it be. Uh, I, I used to work with a literary agent who said that the dead body needs to appear in the first chapter. You have to see it right away. So expanding that sort of just the crime or the intrigue in general, do you have to have that in the first chapter? Let's start with Sharon on that one. You need to know pretty soon what the bigger thing is that's going to make this not just an ordinary day why you care that this person is at this cocktail party or why you care that their flight is delayed or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, I don't want to be so legalistic as to say it has to be the first chapter or else, Um, but you need to know pretty soon where this is going and what type of stakes this is going to be. Um, I think that's a pretty good rule of thumb, even if you're putting it three pages into the second chapter. (laughs) That's a good thing to kind of keep in mind as you're measuring stick, even if you go around the edges a little. And Megan, it sounds like you you definitely, especially in in Winter Sister, you established very quickly that there was a dead body, there was a murder. Is this something that you, you know, did you know this this sort of generality beforehand or was it just something that you knew that you had to put to crime that quick? I think that, um, so I wrote two, novels before The Winter Sister got published. So I think now having written several novels, um, my instinct as a storyteller is always to within or by the end of the first chapter to have kind of the premise of the book have happened. Like what you read on the back of the book, like that has happened. We have seen the big thing, the inciting incident that's going to set these characters off. Um, And I know some people like, that might be moving a little too quick for them. Um, but I like to really just dive right into it and and then 
let it go. Mm -hmm. So one question I always like to ask is, is, we often hear as writers that you have to do something that's the same but different, which is just always sort of perplexing to me. So especially with mystery and thriller, where I, I do I feel like it's more formulaic. There are certain things you have to adhere to. Megan, how did you go about doing something different? Did you did did that actively? Were you actively thinking I had to do something different, or were you just telling your story? Yeah, I try not to think about that because, um, I mean, I think with any genre, so many stories have already been told. It's really impossible that you're going to do something completely unique that doesn't have threads or seeds in in other books. Um, so I kind of try to tune out that sort of noise when I'm when I'm actually writing. I'm just sitting down and saying, okay. Um, what is the story I want to tell? What are the themes? How do I get to those themes through the plot? And the thing I actually worry about doing more is sort of like plagiarizing my own ideas and doing things that are too similar to other things I've already written. Um, so yeah, so I think if you put that pressure on yourself that you have to write this completely new thing, um, I don't know, that seems really paralyzing to me. I think it's better to just stay authentic with the kind of story that you want to tell and and then of course you know if there's something that is very similar to that then you have to find another way to tell it but um there's only so many human stories i think so there's always going to be that overlap mm -hmm. and sharon do you have anything to add on that on this whole concept that you have to do something different while still fitting into your genre yeah i think um <clears throat> it might be helpful if you think of the different part of that is your creative process <clears throat> and dialing into who is your character what do they want what's driving them what don't they want what are their obstacles creating a full person and following their journey on the page and then the same part of it is the business and marketing part of your life as a writer where you say okay what are my cups where does this live in the market what agents are best for this what is this which subcategory should i aim for and then you can kind of say well this is feeling like three different things let me revise because i really think it's most like this or this is feeling a little too similar to that attica lockbook that just came out because of the setting so let me revise to make sure that what is different about it really comes out um because that's what we're really going for in the same and different. We want it the same enough that we know how to position it, know what to compare it to, know how to make our business decisions about how much money should it be offered and what authors are similar to it that should write a quote. And then the different part is we want your voice, your characters, your experiences infusing the page and an ending that we don't expect. So um, I think that might help writers be less paralyzed if they think of it as two different parts of the writing process rather than a paradoxical thing they're trying to do both at once at all times mm -hmm. and then you use one as sort of a uh, checks and balances to, to the other to make sure you're finding the right spot on that line for you and for your story. Mm -hmm. Megan do you ever worry that readers will solve the mystery of your book before they get to the end and is that like a concern? I'm not worried about it but I like it's it's kind of seems like every review I read reader review whether it's my own book or other thrillers, readers seem to be a lot of times basing their opinion on a book about whether or not they can figure it out. And it kind of seems like, I would think like if you figured it out, like, yay, that's even more exciting because you knew the secret thing. But a lot of times people get kind of mad if they're like, oh, I knew what it was gonna be, so it was predictable. And I always say this thing, I say like, I'm not necessarily out to surprise my readers, I'm out to surprise my characters. And I think that in building those surprises for the characters, hopefully you do surprise the readers. But for me, that's not my primary goal. I'm not trying to build in twists for the sake of a twist. Um, I want the twists to make sense for what the character is going through, for how it's going to make them reevaluate their world and their um, values and everything. Um, so, I mean, obviously I don't want somebody to open the book and say, I know exactly how this is going to end, but if they start to figure things out as they go along, I hope that I've written a book that they're still invested in the character and in finding out how the character is going to react to those big curveballs that they might see coming. Mm -hmm. And Sharon, since you see so many mysteries coming through, do, do you 
often know how it's going to go? And how big of a part does that play in your decision making? Um, well, it's, I think for a book that I'm not excited about and I'm not going to represent, I don't ever find out if I guess the right ending because I haven't stuck with the manuscript long enough because there weren't enough other things. I love this character. The setting is so engaging. This voice is fresh and keeping me compelled. Um, that I'll finish the journey and then think about, well, was this too guessable? And if so, is there a small tweak that can be made? Um, I think for me, I'm more evaluating. For me, it's always a balance of it's fun to guess some things, especially as if you are a avid suspense reader, it's a little bit fun to kind of be like, oh, I have a theory about this. Let's see if I'm right. Um, and still be surprised by other things along the way, the character's motivations, the way the person investigating found out or the way the main character discovered the secret. Um, or I was right about the small part and wrong about the big part, that sort of balance of this really surprised me. I couldn't see it coming. And I guessed something, not because I had read so many of these before, but because I'm getting to know this character and guessed what I thought they would do or what I thought they had done. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but it's, it's bigger than just, for me, it's bigger than just, did I guess it or not? It's, was this satisfying or not? Did I believe it the whole time or not? Did these feel like real people acting in believable ways and did I, care about what happened to them or did I enjoy hating them as the case may be um it's not as easy for me it's not as easy as just did I guess this or not gotcha. um but I'm also just probably not getting to the reveals on many of the ones that might be still sticking a little too close to their inspirations and in how the story plays out and on a personal note whenever I read a mystery and I think Sharon you've touched on this a little bit so I want to ask you this first I've had it before where I get to the end and the, the culprit is somebody who had like one line on page 14 and it drives me nuts because I feel like that wasn't an earned ending. Is that something that, I, I, again, I think you mentioned this earlier, but is that something that you try to avoid? Is that like an acceptable mode of surprise? Like, hey, you never expected it to be this person. I think that's something that is a little bit out of vogue right now and has been out of vogue for probably most of my lifetime. Um, that's something I think of more, you know, those old British novelists um, and people who are still kind of writing in that tradition. Um, that's something that I don't think I would be likely to sign on as an agent or be super excited about as a reader, even if it kept me invested the whole way, because it, it has a bit of a, well, then why'd I read it then feeling at the end. Um, I think what can work is if you have a very surprising culprit at the end who looking back you realize well this person was more central than I saw the whole time I didn't realize they were a main character but they were always there and now I see all the little things you know all the pies they had their thumb in um, even though at the time I wasn't registering it as a clue or a bad guy flag um, which is easier to kind of describe than explain how to do in the book um, but I do think it's, it would be tough these days for the ending to just be completely out of nowhere and untethered to the rest of the story and feel like, okay, I want to read this again and tell people about it and put my name on it. Um, even though there are a lot of classic mysteries that work that way. Mm -hmm. and, and Megan, how do you handle getting to the solution? Do you leave a trail of breadcrumbs? Is that all part of the outlining process? That's a good question. Um, well, I think, you know, because I always know who did it or whatever the big reveal at the end is, I, I don't know that it's like I'm consciously sitting there being like, here's a breadcrumb, here's a breadcrumb, here's a breadcrumb. I'm just working with the knowledge that I have to make these characters in these situations um, make that ending make sense. Um, I have to earn that ending, as you said. Um, so I think, and, and then, you know, of course you're leaving red herrings and you're um, trying to throw the reader off the scent a little bit. So it is an interesting mix of keeping them um, in a place where once they know the thing, they can go back and be like, okay, that makes sense with the story that's being told, but also trying to not necessarily 
have them get there right away. Mm -hmm. And it's come up a couple of times already. So I just want to talk about red herrings now. Uh, Megan, when you're writing, do you kind of just get a sense when you need to throw in a red herring just to sort of throw the reader off the scent, so to say? Um, I think, I think I always, my process, like the characters come in and then for like some reason that might be like not that big of a deal, but then they become more important as I start to see how they could become a red herring and how they could seem like a suspect in this. Um, so I don't know that I've necessarily set out and been like, okay, and I need three characters who can act as a red herring for this. But I think that just in building the story, I'll see certain characters or certain moments or certain elements to the story that I can be like, ah, okay, that can be like a little bit of misdirection here. Mm -hmm. Sharon, anything to add on red herrings? How often you use them? Is there a such thing as using too many? Can you overwhelm a reader with too many red herrings? I think you definitely can. Um, I don't know that it's a checklist that I can say, you know, you're allowed this many per 70,000 words. Um, I think I get like, I feel like we keep coming back to this, but it is tied into the character's journey and what feels authentic for them. I think there are times that the reader might kind of know something was a red herring, but you're still invested in the, the reason the character is chasing this down. Um, and it it's still tied back to something the character needed to learn as a person, even if it didn't end up bringing us back to the solution, the crime or the secret. Um, so I would say if you feel like your story is lagging or if you're getting feedback from people that it's too guessable, rather than just throw in in chapter 20 and chapter 33 a false trail also think about well how how can i dial into my character how can i figure out where my character might be confused or my character might not recognize something that was happening um not just like a guy in a trench coat plays mini golf for a chapter and then <laughs> we're done with that <laughs> um it, it needs to be organic not just this is too guessable what can I add into the soup? Mm -hmm. So we're starting to wind down on my question. So I want to get a few last ones in there. Sharon, are there any tropes in the mystery thriller genres you're tired of seeing? Just stuff that's that you just wish there wasn't so much of? Is there an oversaturation? I'm personally tired of grumpy, alcoholic old detectives, whether they're still on the force or, you know, retired and divorced and now doing it in their private life. We've had a ton of those. There are legendary characters that fit that mold. It's something that I'm not very excited about personally working on any more of those or reading very many more of those. Um, that's kind of the big one that I see a ton of and complain about a lot. <laughs> um, and then I think my other, one of my other least favorite tropes moving more to the domestic suspense side of it is sort of the spoiled lady in the suburbs and you know kind of like big little lies but there are a lot of big little lies imitators that aren't digging into important things the way big little lies did and and you're just sort of endlessly driving around neighborhoods and suvs while you know pretty ladies argue about things that i'm not very invested in um and so those are the kind of the two that i feel like are we have a lot of and they're not always doing something very entertaining or very meaningful with the 320 pages I'm asked to invest in. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, you know, I represent at least one of each of those categories that is doing something smart and special with the space and the page. And I could sign two more next week when I find something that's just right. So I always hesitate to say there's absolutely no space for X, Y, Z, because that's the moment something will prove me wrong. But, um, if you're looking for a new character to be inspiring and fresh and interesting, those are not the first exits on the highway I suggest you take. <laughs> Megan, anything you're tired of seeing? Um, I guess I'm, to go back to the idea of the twist and the predictability or not predictability, I'm, I'm a little tired of the, this isn't, I don't know if this is even a trope, but just like when books are marketed with the idea that there's this huge twist and you'll never guess it and you won't know and you won't see it coming. Um, because 
in my experience, at least when I have read those kinds of books where that's been kind of the, the lead that people take on promoting them, um, I haven't found the twist to be particularly meaningful. It might be like, oh yeah, I didn't see that coming. But then I'm like, well, what does this mean about the character? What does this mean about the story? I don't, I don't really know. So I guess, I guess I'm, I'm a little tired of just like seeing twists that don't have any emotional re resonance with them. Um, and also, and I think that this is totally Sharon's influence on me. Um, <laughs> I can't stand when a thriller or a mystery has a prologue now because I know that that's one of Sharon's big things um, because we do that is a big thing that happens where you have that prologue that's like a page long or less than a page and it's like I'm at the scene there's blood everywhere he heard me scream what will I do and then it goes on to the next thing and you're like okay um, so so I blame Sharon for that one or I thank Sharon for that one <laughs> yeah I'm, I don't like that that's definitely one of my pet soapboxes. <laughs> <laughs> so last question for me, I just want to hear some book recommendations. If you can think of a few titles within, and you can definitely plug your own books here. That's perfectly fine. Um, Sharon, we'll start with you. Are there just a couple of book recommendations that, that mystery? Um, I have that problem of, I think anyone in publishing or the book industry who the second year asks for book recommendations, every book you've ever read flies out of your head. Um, and I've been reading a lot of nonfiction the past couple of weeks, so that's not really helpful for our topic. Um, I am, I will say I'm very excited. I haven't read this yet. If I'm allowed to do a book I haven't read yet as a recommendation. Um, it just came out yesterday by S.A. Crosby, Blacktop Wasteland. Do I have that right, Megan? Yeah. Not my client, but um, just sounds like a really fresh, original, smart crime novel that I'm really excited to read. Um, that's literally the only book I can think of, but I will think while Megan goes, and if I can remember anything else, I'll add it again after her. That works. Megan, recommendation. Um, I just read uh, Leah Conan's All the Broken People, and I read it in a couple of days, and it was so good, and um, it gave me the feeling that I got when I was reading Gone Girl, which was that, like, I know there's something much deeper working underneath here that we don't know about yet and it's going to come and change everything and and I was right um and um Wendy Walker's next one uh don't look for me that comes out in September was so good another one that I just like flew through um and I think it's her best one yet personally um and then I guess I'll plug my book uh <laughs> next month August 4th um I have it right here Behind the Red Door comes out, um, and it's about a woman who uh, suffers from very acute anxiety, and she comes to believe that she has a connection to a decades-old kidnapping, and now that that kidnapping victim has gone missing again, she's trying to um, uncover how she might know this person or what happened to her so that she can try to save her now before it's too late. Sharon, did any more titles come to you during that? They did not, but I second Megan's recommendation, and you should also read The Winter Sister, her debut, which is also amazing. All right. And All that right. one you don't have to wait till August 4th. <laughs> so let's jump over to some audience questions. Uh, first off, Sharon, this one's for you. To the point about the why in a story, is it necessary to have this explicitly stated, or is it better to just let the reader fill in the blanks and, and sort of make suggestions along the way? Um, more so the latter. I think by the end of the book, you need to, as a reader, have a good idea of why a character did what they did or didn't do what they didn't do. Um, I, you should not, in the first chapter, lay out the characters and, you know, entire motivations or moral view. Um, and I think it's a very, fiction is much more powerful when you leave space for the reader to bring their own emotional nuance. So instead of saying he felt sad, you kind of describe how he's feeling or, or how he's acting or what he's saying. And then the reader can add their own mixture of sad or disappointed or, um, you know, nervous or whatever that nuanced emotion is. Um, but you also don't want to end the book and you've left so much on the reader's imagination and not given any sort of skeleton for the character for them to have a solid understanding of who they've spent time with and and why the events unfolded that they've just, you know, shared their time with you for. 
And Megan, this question is for you. How do you approach sense of humor in, in this? Because again, with it being such a dark themed genre, does the sense of humor help? Do you actively engage with it? Um, is that talking about in the writing itself and the book, having yes. a sense of humor within the book? Correct, yeah. yes. Um, I find that you definitely need, anytime you have that super, super darkness, you need the little bit of light in places. Um, otherwise it's just too much. It's too one note, it's too one texture. Um, and so I usually have a character or two in my books who will be a little bit of a smart ass or a little bit sarcastic or just has a worldview that makes them say ridiculous things. And sometimes the humor isn't even like, oh, that's a funny thing you said. It's like, wow, that's a terrible thing for a mother to say to their daughter. So like, I'm almost laughing about it. Like, what is this? Um, so I think that there is definitely a space and a purpose for sense of humor in dark books, just as in, um, you know, like a romance, a rom-com, a lighter book, I think there still has to be that little bit of texture of darkness in some way, whatever, however that comes in. Mm -hmm. and, and Sharon, I want to turn that to you as well. Are you more, are you more drawn if there's a good sense of humor in a mystery? Is that a, a key component? Yeah, I think if it's done with a good hand and with nuance, um, I think it's helpful. There's a a rule of thumb in comedy that you punch up, not punch down. So you want to make sure you're not making jokes at the expense of a victim, of a marginalized person, someone who doesn't have agency in the story, or making light of things that shouldn't be made light of. Um, but as Megan was saying, a character who has a more outgoing sense of humor, um, whether that's your main character or a secondary character, in regular life, there's you make dark jokes about dark things and even in the middle of horrible stuff you laugh at a meme on the internet or whatnot um so if you look for authentic ways to incorporate that in the story it can be a great way to character build um, you just want to make sure you're not doing it in a way that's insensitive to you know real people are going to be reading your books who've gone through some of these things um, and you don't want to sound like you're trivializing stuff that's actually very serious so if you kind of think about it as punching up and making sure it's tied to characters and not sort of the narrator's voice trivializing I think that's that's the way to find the right path to humor to lighten a dark a dark novel gotcha and here's an interesting question for Megan when writing the winter sister were you already thinking about your characters and plot for behind the red door oh no I had completely um, finished and sold The Winter Sister before the idea for Behind the Red Door came to me. Um, but for my last couple projects, um, once I get, once I see the light at the end of the draft, so to speak, um, like once I'm sort of nearing at the end, my brain just will start to go to other places and start to think about new story ideas. So that didn't happen for me with The Winter Sister. And I think it was because at that point I was um, so focused on like, am I gonna get a book published and I'm gonna do this, that like, I just couldn't go there yet. Um, so now that that question has been answered, I guess I have um, a little more room to think about that while I'm still in the writing process for something else. Mm -hmm. So Sharon, this is a question for you. For mystery and thriller in particular, d does a pitch have to include the solution or do you, are you just trying to entice the agent to want more? I prefer that it not include the solution because um, you are trying to entice me. You want it to be more along the lines of the back of the book where you get a good sense of who the characters are, what is what are the stakes and kind of what level is this mystery? Is this more of a light cozy? Is this a really intense thriller that's going to have a high body count? Um, but I don't want to know when I start reading who did it or why they did it um, because that takes some of the fun out of it and it also hampers my ability to assess well are the twists working do I believe in this character um, does this plot hold up if I know at the start who the culprit is going to be or, or what the reveal is going to hinge on so, Megan, another question for you. How important is setting in your stories? Is that something that you put particular focus on or is it just kind of wherever it happens to be? 
um, it's really important for me. And I think, um, I think, yeah, for all, like all, everything that I've written, well, yeah, mostly everything I've written, the setting is kind of a small town. And I think that I really gravitate towards that, um, especially for this genre where that can feel pretty claustrophobic phobic sometimes, um, which I think adds to the atmosphere, adds to the tension. Um, so yeah, I think a lot about setting and about how is the setting going to um, put even more pressure on the characters in a way, whether it's because of who lives there or what it's like. Um, for example, in Behind the Red Door, um, when the main character, Fern, she returns to her hometown in New Hampshire to help her father move. And she has a lot of like complicated feelings about where she grew up, but there's these woods right by her house that have always really freaked her out. And she's somebody who's incredibly anxious all the time anyway, but um, I wanted the, the woods to really play off of that anxiety, sometimes kind of represent that anxiety that they're so deep and so unknowable kind of, just like her anxiety is, but like always she can't drive home without passing them, they're always there. Um, so I like to think of ways that the setting can um, play off of the characters and that the characters can be forced um, out of comfort zones sometimes, even if it's a place that they think they're really familiar with. Mm -hmm. And Sharon, turning that around to you, how, how big of a role is setting in, in your traditional mystery, thriller, whatever it is? I personally am often drawn to places, to novels that have a really strong sense of place and where the setting is almost a character as Megan was describing. Um, but it's also very possible, and I have loved books, that the setting is more, you know, generic Midwest, generic big city, generic southern city, and the author doesn't choose to use a sense of place as a character, as a pressure point. Um, the momentum of the story comes more from the character development and um, other factors that it, it's not as sharp where you are beyond the general sense of city or small town, you know, north or south, cold or hot. Um, so it's, it's something that works very well, but it's not impossible to write a really strong unputdownable suspense novel um, without that sense of place mm -hmm. and I think whether you write with it or whether you write with other things determining the shape of your story has a lot to do with your voice mm -hmm. as a writer so last question before I let you both go I just want as concisely as possible the best advice you could give to an aspiring mystery thriller author uh, Megan let's start with you um I'm going to give the same advice that I give to a writer of any genre, which is just like, you have to keep pushing, you have to keep going. Like if your goal, if your dream, if what you're working toward is being, uh, is getting an agent and then getting published and, and doing all those things, um, you're going to face a lot of rejection and it doesn't mean anything about you. It's just how it works. Um, and it can be really easy to kind of crumple under that or to say, I'm not going to put myself through this anymore. Um, but you just have to keep pushing. You just have to trust that like the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. And you're then you're working towards that. Yes, that you will eventually get. And Sharon. I definitely agree with that. And my advice is similar, um, to, to know why you're writing and what keeps you coming back to this story, which might feel a little bit goofier to think through to yourself if you're writing about, you know, like a detective in Scotland who's has like three bodies in the sheepyards. It's hard to see like, well, why is this passionate and exciting to me? But if you figure out what about this story you keep coming back to, where do you want, what do you want your reader to feel or think about when they're reading this book? Um, it'll keep you going through some of those challenging parts of it that Megan was mentioning. And it can also be, um, a tool to help you figure out who your character is and some of the character development things we keep coming back back to during this conversation. Why the story is important to you to tell is very closely tied into who your character is to their why um, and to that satisfying ending that we keep talking about. Um, so, you know, also read a lot, all the things that you're going to see on every writer, writer's blog, but I think figuring out for you why you write in general, but also why you're writing this book can help you through a, a lot of the challenges, both on the page and just sort of in your own head of getting through the writing and publishing experience. Gotcha. 
All right, so this is the point in the show where I tell you both goodbye. Thank you so much for being here. You've been wonderful guests. Thank you. This is fun. Yeah, thank you. All right, so you all are good to go, and then I'm going to keep going and tell people how to get involved with the uh, Twitter pitch party. Um, so, again, thank you both for being here. Have a good rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. All right, so for everyone that wants to get involved with the Twitter pitch party afterwards, let me do my usual sharing of the screen. Here we go. All right, so as usual, you will have until this coming Friday at midnight to pitch your book to Sharon. Uh, the, the guidelines can be found on the Gotham blog as well as on the inside writing page on the Gotham Writers website. But I just want to go through real quick some of the, the most important points. First off, you got when you tweet your pitch, make sure you include the hashtag P-I-T-G-O-T-H-A-M. That's Pit Gotham. If you do not include that, I can't find your pitch. So make sure you do that. You don't have to tag anyone. Uh, as far as best practices to make sure that, that your pitch gets sent to Sharon, make sure that it's just a one tweet pitch. Condense your whole book into a single tweet. It's not easy, but it, it, it's something, it's one of our guidelines. So make sure that you do that. If you have more than one book, we do allow you to pitch them both. Just make sure that they're in separate tweets. Also, make sure you come up with a good comparable title or two uh, just to help the agent understand where this fits on the bookshelves. Uh, and then as far as how to fit that all into one tweet, keep it simple. Focus on what makes your book unique. Usually that's the protagonist and the main drive of the plot. Also, you want to try to end with a hook, something to get the agent intrigued. And again, make sure you include the hashtag P-I-T-G-O-T-H-A-M. So that's how to do that. Also, as I mentioned, the Gotham Writers Conference is going this year. So October 16th through 18th, we're going to be on Zoom. Uh, we do have a mystery and thriller table where you can, you can pitch your mystery thriller book to two agents. Uh, you'll get four hours with them to talk about your book as well as the rest of the people at the table. And Sharon is one of the agents there. Um, so you're, you can pitch her on Twitter. You, you I mean, you will forward your pitches onto her on Twitter, and then you can also meet her on Zoom uh, with your own project at the Gotham Writers Conference. So again, thank you all for being here. Next week, we're going to be talking about graphic novels. Uh, registration for that is open on the Gotham website, so you can register whenever. Uh, next week, graphic novels and the recording for this session, in case you missed anything, should be up at some point tomorrow. Thank you all again for being here, and we'll see you next week.